All right, right, folks, I want to welcome our guest tonight. It's Kane from Ohio. Welcome to the show, Kane. How you doing? Absolutely fabulous, man. I've been waiting to, to get you on the show. I've been excited to talk to you. So let's get right into it. Let's talk about the Bigfoot thing. Let's let's go down the road of most of the guests I have on the show. I like to know what got you interested in the subject and what got you started on this path that you've been on. Actually, it was um, probably did a stint with, uh, I think, with, with a lot of researchers. Started out uh, investigating paranormal stuff. I had a house that had a lot of paranormal stuff going on at the time, and I would talk about it a lot um, with some of my friends. And it just so happened one of my my research partner, Matthias Tipton, uh, we were doing construction together and would have about an hour and a half drive. And we just talked about all kinds of subjects and me being open talk about paranormal stuff he brought up an encounter that he had about I think it was 20 years ago in northern Ohio and I think I was the only second person he ever shared that with and he had a sighting on the side of a road and through the course of that conversation me being naive I'm like well you know Ohio Ohio is not very, not a very big state. There's not a lot of woods, whatever. And let's go, let's go look for it. And that kind of started our journey. And we didn't really, at first, we weren't involved with any groups. Um, everything I think that we know was firsthand, just our truth. You know, the things that happened to us, the sightings we've had, my entire theories on everything come from actually being in the woods and seeing it for myself. So I think that helped us uh, in the long run because you didn't have one group thinking this or that is just kind of what we know. And that started our journey. Um, when we started off is probably about a decade ago. And I know we started off, we would go out 46 weekends a year and which was a lot uh, for anybody, but that we did that for several years. It was right around average about, uh, I think about 46 weekends a year, we were out in the woods, camping mostly off grid, uh, never using hiking trails. A lot of times what we would do, we would just pull off the side of the road and go, that looks cool, let's, let's go hike to that horizon. And that's kind of how we started it. And through that, um, the activity found us, I guess. It's, it's, we, we, weren't, we didn't know what we were doing. Um, but if you hike long enough and you're out there in the woods enough, eventually, I think, you, you, you increase your chances for an encounter. But then over the years, we started recognizing certain things would happen in certain areas. We take note and we just build on that. And you started off, I, I remember, I remember I, probably the first thing, and I, I just to clarify, I was not a true Bigfoot believer at the time. I was definitely open, but it, it really hadn't even entered my mind. Um, I just, I thought, well, you know, anything's possible. And like most people, I thought it was like a Oregon, California thing. I never thought about Ohio. And I remember one of the first things that happened to us, we were, I would say, at least 45 minutes off trail or so. It was in the winter. And we came across a trackway of bare footprints in the snow, probably the best prints I've ever seen in my life. But what really got me was there was a set of small prints, uh, three or four inches that followed this this other set and this trackway was long and we actually convinced ourselves that this must be a some crazy hippie out there you know just out in the woods like done lost their mind or something but that bothered me I, all the whole way home I'm like I can see maybe maybe a person 
going out there barefoot or something, but who would have their kid? I mean, you're going to have frostbite. I know now with my wilderness experience, you're going to have frostbite in an hour. I mean, Ohio is a frigid place in the winter and I've even done tests. And that's really what started it for me was those the first initial tracks seeing that and I just could not get that out of my mind like who would let their kid walk in the snow uh, so far off I mean from that point and what it really was when it, it crossed uh, I think it was an old logging road so it maybe it went through the woods got on this old logging road for maybe 100 yards and then crossed through and I mean, I wish I could go back in time and cast. I mean, these were beautiful prints, um, but we we let we just didn't know enough about the subject. We kind of let that go, and we first started too. Um, we'd hear tree knocks, and and always thought, well, that's got to be another camper or someone out there hiking, or and we ignored a lot of stuff. Um, until we had our, our real first encounter was in Wayne National Forest. And it was tree knocks, but it was like a, a machine gun. I, I cannot even express to you the power that this and the, the speed of it. And it was hitting this tree so hard that you could hear it's the splintering off the tree. I mean, you could just hear splinters. And it was just like everything was calm, just like a normal hiking day. We were we were off trail a long ways at this time. And then just, I mean, all hell broke loose it just in an instant. And there was rock clacking going on and we were we were surrounded. And this this encounter lasted maybe between five to ten minutes. And then it just it it just stopped and everything went back to normal and that was the day I was telling my research partner I was like I don't care you know today I am hiking as far as I can hike to make sure that there's not campers up there or something even though in my mind I knew this was different um we did we hiked a mile past the radius and there we're so far out in the woods I mean we know so much more now the areas we go into where potential hikers or whatever it can be. And that's one of the things we try to do is avoid those areas uh, so we could get into just prime wilderness and not have to worry about human activity. And this was one of those places uh, that we know now, but that that was a, a big start into it. And the 46 weekends a year evolved into me buying another property adjacent to a natural preserve right to my backyard to where I did a stint where I was in the woods every day for three years um, doing a looking at tree structures and and tracking it and just trying to see what you know I was fortunate enough to have the opportunity to do something like this and I'd never heard of anyone actually documenting every single day what it's like to be out in the woods so I did that, I, uh, and that opened my eyes. And then to where, now where I currently live, I live in a cabin in Hocking County, Ohio, which is, butts up to the Wayne National Forest System to where uh, that's like a million acres of forestry land. My, my backyard butts up to that. So I can go right out the back of my cabin and hike. And I can hike into that million acres right from here. And this cabin is remote. Uh, no one lived in it for almost 20 years before I bought it. It was their vacation cabin. It was a, a little wealthier family in the area. This was like their, their cabin they used for holidays and Christmas get togethers. So for like 20 years, no one's lived here permanently. And <clears throat> when, I, when I looked at the house to have it inspected, I had the inspector go check out the cabin and I, I went out in the woods and I saw things out in the woods that looked very 
very much what I would expect for something that has activity in it. It was close enough. And so I bought the cabin. I've been here now three years. And I guess what I like to tell people now is I try to take what I've learned and I document movement. I document any strange activities around here, uh, tree knocks. And then I just document, I try to be out there every day again uh, and just try to feel what it's like to live in an area. And, and it's, it's definitely opened my mind to what it's like to actually live in an area that's potentially active. And I say that because it's my thoughts, it's my, my truth that these, these things move. And it might be a week of activity, 30 days of nothing. It might be a week and a half of activity, two months of nothing. It might be three days of activity, a week off, and, and it, it's so random. It's, it's really hard. You just have to be out here to, to experience it and document it. And, you know, I've learned a lot. I've learned a lot of being a fly on the wall, basically. Uh, I don't do a lot as far as, you know, I don't, I don't really mess with anything out here. I document and I, I do I do some things out here in the woods, but I I try to just monitor and just be part part of just another living creature out here. And I've had I've had some crazy experiences um, living out here like this. And the it's remote. Um, Behind me, I know just just the set of woods that's right behind me is 700 acres. Uh, if uh, I was to get hurt, I have no. I step out of the cabin, I have no signal. From the minute I have to use Wi-Fi calling, everything's on Wi-Fi here. If I was to get hurt and have to call an ambulance, I'm looking at 45 minutes to an hour, irregardless. Um, that's just just how how far out we live and anybody on this road lives and I live here by myself and it can be creepy at times and it can be great at times you can do whatever you want out here you know <laughs> but at, at times it, it it can be it can be kind of creepy that's one of the things I love about we have 40 acres here in North Carolina and we're probably 10 minutes away from you know a Walmart but once you get on our road, it is so isolated and there's nobody around us. Our closest neighbor is about a half a mile away and it can get creepy and dark in the woods. If you've never experienced that and you don't know what you don't, you don't have street lights and all these things that, that go on around you. It's, it's a creepy feeling, but I, I agree with you. I think it's, it's one of the most fantastic things you can ever experience is being, you know, we lived off grid here and on our property for almost two years before we got electricity and, water and and all the things that we have now so i can definitely relate on some level to that we we're not surrounded by as many acres of property and, and land that you are but there's so many things that you talked about in the beginning that i want to go back to but first and foremost let's just get into some of the experiences that you've had either on your property or other places while you've been doing your research what what are you finding and what kind of experiences and encounters have you had I've had, um, I believe it's three visuals. Now, my encounters that I've had um, have been, I've never seen its face. I've, I've had three good encounters, but it's always been um, just not quite good enough to see, to actually see the, the face of one of these things, but to know that it's real. Um, my first my first true encounter was in a place called um it's uh, i think they call it little egypt it's almost next to pennsylvania in ohio and uh we were hiking and this is one of those days where like i said we we would never we would just get out of the car and we would hike and we got to this place it's it, probably almost three hours from here 
at the time it's probably a two hour drive we got there and it's all like when you get out of your car it looks like all kinds of meadows and then way in the distance you can see trees so we were like oh this kind of sucks but i mean we're here so let's go ahead and, and we just started hiking and little do we know this this place is it's got every geological feature that you could that you could think of it it, it wasn't a plain a prairie it, it, it had deep valleys i mean dr drop offs 100 feet and i mean it was actually a really hellish place to try to go hike in but we had we went ahead and went through that and we hiked to this tree line which was at the horizon from where our car was and at one point we had to cross a fence. Um, it was one of those deals where we were so far out and we're like, you know, do you turn turn back now? The woods are right here. Now there's a damn fence in our way. Let's let's just go across this fence and, and go up a little ways and see what happens. Um, so we did, and it ended up being it was a game preserve or something out there. We didn't know it at the time, but I just happened to look up and there was this dead tree and I actually have a picture that happened right before this encounter of this dead tree and I seen this uh, ahead um, bobbing back and forth as it was coming down this ridge um, well <laughs> what I thought was coming down the ridge I see this head and it's swaying back and forth and it, it kind of actually reminded me of uh, German Shepherd colors. And it was just the top of the forehead and I really didn't think much about it from my angle. But I actually thought that it was someone that had their dog and their dog was running out in front of them. So we kind of paused and we waited it out. Then we went up to where this dead tree was and lo and behold, this crook of this tree where I, where I saw this head peak you know go through this tree and bobbing up and down was like 10 feet off the ground and there was absolutely nothing around it like with your vantage of my my eyesight to where I was it, it just none of this made sense and we ended up hearing this thing it was still moving so we we we, we started tracking it and as we started tracking it um we it went up this cliff I'd say about 1200 feet in elevation and it was dragging something we could hear it dragging and and but we could never catch it so that was that was really my first actual sighting my second sighting was a lot better that happened at salt fork ohio um this sighting was we had were on a horse trail and my partner went one way and I went another way and I got off the horse trail and I was going over this ridge. And during this time, I had started training myself that whenever I hear a tree knock to look the opposite direction. Because by that time we'd figured out that that first tree knock you hear is usually a distraction. So I did, I, you know, and that's hard to do when something's really loud to, to not look at the direction of the tree knock, but to look the opposite direction. But that day, I came across this ridge and there was a massive tree knock. So I just immediately looked the other way and I see two individuals. And it's probably from, I would say the mid torso up. And these things were running parallel to each other. And there was a span of trees that, I, I would say the span of trees, I had a good 30, 40 yards in between these trees. It was a good clip. One, one thing about it was they ran silently. They were only maybe a foot apart from each other, which was really weird. Um, they were massive. The, the, these, these things were, and I, you know, I, I've, I've done a lot of testing my own, what I saw that day, and I would watch cars driving at my property down the road in between about the same gap of trees these things were running every bit of 45 miles an hour i mean every bit so they they 
ran in between these two trees in a really weird that they're it's like they're floating their heads never bobbed once no up and down motion just smooth and almost like shadows across the wall if you can imagine that and then as soon as they got out of my line of sight it sounded like two elephants go running through the, the woods unbeknownst to me my research partner was on the other side of the ridge so these things were basically running I was on one side of the ridge listening to this and, and hearing this he was on the other side listening to something coming into the woods as well but what he was doing he was perched up and he was watching a deer and her fawn and these deer came down in this ridge right to where these things had stopped and all he he saw the the mother jump like something spooked it jumped and they heard he heard the fawn just get killed right there like it just something killed it he heard a death a death call and that's about the time I was texting him. I'm like, dude, you, you're not going to believe what, <laughs> what I just saw. And he's, he's like, well, I, you're not going to believe what I just heard. I just seen something crazy out here. So I got him back to where I had the siding. And I tried to get him to recreate it. And I had my video just so I could, you know, watch fresh in my mind. I told him, I was like, here's the two trees. Here's where I was standing. You know, when, when I give you the signal, run in between these two trees so I can so I can film it, at least have something to go by. So I give him the signal and I'm waiting, I'm waiting. I don't see him. So I holler down at him. I'm like, hey, did you run? He's like, yeah. I'm like, well, I didn't I didn't see you. And he's like, well, hold on a second. And he got a stick and he put his hat on a stick and he just kept raising it up. And he's like, tell me when you can see me. And uh, it was eight foot or better before I could actually see see where that hat was even in my line of sight. And then he's like, uh, buddy, he's like, there's no way you can run on that terrain. It's, he's like, it's the side of a ridge. It's, it's probably worse than a 45 degree slope. He's like, whatever, if something was running across there, like a human can't do that. And I, I had a lot of, I mean, I knew exactly there was a lake behind there. I mean, I, I knew the exact two trees. And what really stuck with me was not so much, like, again, I, did, I didn't get a lot of facial details. I didn't get anything like that. I just got, I just got these, these things were massive. I mean, compare, once I had something to compare it to, I mean, they, they were jet black, both of them. They were massive. It almost reminded me, and I, people think it's funny, but it almost looked like the size of two Christmas trees. Uh, that kind of bulk and that cone head, you know, um, that kind of mass going between those trees and just catching a glimpse of the back of it at, at, as the last one go through. But they, the movement was so weird. Um, Things just don't move like that, 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 that I've ever seen out in nature. This, there was no bob in the head. It was just completely smooth, uh, what, however their, their gait is. And then just the speed, I, you know, a lot of people have in their mind what the Patterson-Gimlin film and, and the slow lumbering creature goes across. I, I believe that that whatever was caught on film there that is just one aspect but these things i know for a fact can can run every bit of 45 miles an hour with without a doubt so that was startling to me um you want me to go into the, my next one or yeah i would say just just <laughs> go right into the next one and i i think that was a good point you made about the patterson gimlin film because i've I've interviewed so many people doing this show. And that's one of the things that I always get from witnesses is how incredible the movement that these things 
are, whether they're crawling. I've had people talk about the spider crawl and the things that they've experienced. And typically it is how fast and how silent they are when they're running. And it's very similar to what you said. I don't know if it's, it's got something to do with a compliant gate or w- whatever the case may be. They're able to produce that type of speed without any bobbing of the head and, and all those things that is, I hear it over and over and over again. You know, when people have had visual sightings of these things, that's one of the things that they remark about often is how fast it was and how abnormal the movement and how unnatural it appeared, but how very natural it, it appeared to be for the animal, if that makes any sense. It's something we don't, it doesn't register to us as something we've recognized in other animals. However, it looks very natural to them. So yeah, absolutely. I, that's your great segue into the, you mentioned the spider crawl and that's exactly my next encounter. Um, I didn't really realize at the time, but you know, one of the things I do is I, this, this was a period of time when I was on my other property and that was during that three year stretch where I was out there every single day. And the things were ramping up um, at this time for about the mo- a month prior to this sighting. Uh, there was a lot of activity going on. I was recording a lot of stuff. Um, and it was right around um, August, I believe. I'm not good with dates, but I do I do know that I, I believe this happened somewhere around August. So in that time period, things just were ramping up behind behind the house there. And there was things such as, um, people talk about wood structures and stuff, and we could get into that later, but I had actually, by going into the woods every single day, documented 18 wood structures the day after they were, they, they were made. And that was why I was in the woods. And it took me a year uh, of in the woods every day to find these spots. And then after it took another year to actually witness this. And then it was another year of, of not messing with these structures, but watching them every single day to, to, to just document if anything changes or whatever. But I had, uh, at the time he's a Doberman and he was still young and he, he, he was my hiking buddy. And we had just gotten him neutered like the week before. And I'd gotten home late. And normally that's a little later than I, I, I try to hike every night after work. That's kind of my routine. Even to this day, that's what I try to do even here. But go to work, come before I even get in the house, straight out in the woods till dark. And then I try to be back. And it was already getting closer to dark. But my dog was just now, he, you know, he'd been laid up for a week and he was looking at me and he's wanting to go hiking, you know, that was, and I finally broke down. I'm like, all right, we'll, we'll go hiking. So it was a different time is what I'm getting at a different time than I'm usually heading out into the woods. So we get out there and, um, unbeknownst to me, it just, just out of nowhere, I just look over. I'm I'm down in a lo- the lower part, uh, a kind of a flat, and I'm surrounded by ridges. And I just happen to look up, and I uh, this this thing comes out, and I don't think it sees me because it it it's it's not facing me. It's like crossing my path, but from a good distance. Uh, maybe maybe 120 yards um it's at the top of the ridge i'm basically about 30 yards from the lower part of the ridge uh coming up to this ridge this thing comes out and it's it is kind of like a belly crawl um it's it's <laughs> It's hard to it's hard to explain because this is such an alien type of 
thing to watch, but it's possible it was on its toes and just its fingers. Um, and kind of cartoony. Now, in retrospect, this thing was either five, five, six feet. I mean, it wasn't giant, it was, a, it was smaller, but this thing came out across um, in like this creepy belly crawl, like on its fingers and on its toes, flat across, flat across the ridge, turns and sees me, puts its hands together and, and jumps in one leap from the top of that ridge all the way down to the bottom of the ridge, which is probably uh, in my mind at least 30 yards and one jump and it has its fist out like Superman, jumps down into this, this these bushes. And I'm, I'm just bewildered at what I, I, I'm trying to calculate in my head, like what, what in the hell was the, that? Now I'm a guy out looking for Bigfoot. <laughs> and this is so mind blowing. I, I, I was for lack of words. It took me, it took me well over a week to even come up with a, uh, a way to describe what I saw. And what I ended up saying was this thing was like moving like a salamander. Um, it had very long arms and jumbo sized hands. Like its hands were like Mickey Mouse, you know, uh, th that much bigger th than its arms. Um, it jumps down into this, into these brush. And I'm not really thinking straight. I'm, I'm still just trying to calculate what I just saw. So I inherently, I start walking up to this bush. Um, and then it kind of dawns on me as I'm walking, I get, I get pretty close to it. And it just kind of dawns on me, maybe this isn't the, the best idea. I'm sitting out here, uh, my dog, he's just been neutered. He's a he was younger at the time. He ended up being about 120 pound Doberman. So he was his own force of nature, but he was, he was medicated. Um, he really didn't have a clue what was going on. So I just turned, I mean, as soon as I turned around, there was, uh, I don't even, I don't know if it was the, uh, rocks, something throw, either throwing a rock at me or, you know how the gorillas do the chest thing? It sounds very similar to that, but it, another one throws a rock and lands behind me and the, the woods come alive. And I call my research partner at his house and I'm like, um, I, I think I'm in trouble. I, I'm, I'm in a situation I've got these things behind me, and as I'm talking to them on the phone, one house or does like a whoop right through the direction that I have to walk to get home. It's right on top of that ridge, and I got to go there. So he kind of talked me through it, and he's just like, "Man, just stay calm, just walk the creek bed, just walk, you know, mind your business, and and just get out of there." So I ended up doing that. Some of this I have on film. I don't know if you're familiar, but I have a video called the Rock Rock Throw Video. That's on my website, uh, House of Enoch, where I try to explain. You can definitely see something throwing a rock um, that I caught off of maybe an iPhone 8. Uh, and I was, when I walked up to look at the, the first individual, um, I was very close to this other, I didn't even see it. So when I turned around and came back, I was with I was within 10, 20 yards of where this one threw the rock. And I just I, I didn't see it. I did a lot of analysis on that video and it's still perplexing to this day um, what's on that video because you you definitely see something moving, but you also see this massive, I mean a massive black shadow basically behind this tree and I've done enough comparison shots and stuff that 
at that same time, any given day, you can see through the tree line. You can see trees behind it. You can't when, you, when you're looking at this video. But I, I get out of there and no, you know, not, nothing happened. I got out okay, but these things followed me home. And I had, a, at the time, I had a FLIR scout and I had, a, so my, my house that I lived, it looked over a preserve. The whole back of the house was glass. And on the second floor was where the bedroom was that went out to a two-story deck. And I could just open the door right there, walk out. So, and I did that almost every night. Um, just just uh, look around, get my flare out and stuff. And this, this night, I, I, first I just went out and what caught me by surprise, I stepped out onto the deck and something was in my backyard. I had an in-ground pool. And as soon as I stepped onto the deck, something took off in the back and like I had a fenced in yard, woods all around it. As this thing took off, it, it knocked over the pool furniture, like the lawn chairs and everything. It, it, it knocked those over, scared the living hell out of me. I'm not scared to admit that. Um, I kept my FLIR right inside on my dresser. So I grabbed the FLIR. I went back out, I turned the FLIR on, and at the time I thought that this thing had ran out into the woods. So I'm out on my deck looking out in the woods, trying, trying to locate, like, there's got to be a heat signature here. That's not what it did. It was underneath me. Like I mentioned, I had a two-story deck. It didn't run out to the woods, it ran directly underneath me. And there's a screen door to my house that was directly underneath me and it about tore the door off its hinges. Again, I'm directly under this and it's, I mean, powerful. It sounds like it's coming in the house. Um, at the time I, I'm unarmed. I'm, I, I am, it's pitch dark. Even there it was pitch dark. I run into the house and uh, kind of, get my wits together again and so I, I finally I go back out and I try to look down and it's not under the deck anymore it had moved and now I, I had a pool house built and it was, it was a nice pool house in the in the backyard and I'm walking the deck and it is walking as I'm trying to get the right angle with my flare to get the right angle to see behind the pool house, it's going around the pool house to where I can't get it on the flare. But there's another one there. And it it ends up, I mean, it sounds like a gun blast. It's, it, it hits a tree out in the back. I look over, you know, pan the woods again. And then this other one, it hits my, it hits my pool house. And the next day I was able to get a track in my mulch and I have a muddy handprint. I've got, actually there's a lot of weird stuff that of evidence after this night, but uh, there's a giant muddy handprint where it slapped, it slapped my pool house. Um, it got to the point, I mean, if I was rattled, um, this is now at my home and if I had a machine gun, I would have lit up. The, I would. I was in that state of mind. I would have lit up, lit up that whole area. I mean, it took me a night to think about it, and I just kind of came away with the conclusion, like maybe I was being a little bit punished for seeing them. And they're like, if you want to go into our area, well, we know where you live too, because <laughs> things things calm down after that. I mean, there was still activity the entire time I lived on that property. Um, but it wasn't aggressive like that. That was definitely seemed aggressive to me that night, which long story short, I moved out of that place. I moved into 
actually uh, had a life change. I moved into a camper trying to decide what I want to do with my life. I bought a bought a 21 foot camper, lived in that for about a year, and then uh, decided I, I wanted to be further in the woods. And I found this place. I moved here about three years ago and just <laughs> more remote, more time in the woods and restarted my life here. And that kind of gets us up to about the last three years. Well, there's um, definitely some awesome encounters, man. I, I definitely appreciate you sharing those. And I, I do my research behind a microphone, right? I, I collect people's stories and I, I put the show out every week and, and let people hear what people are experiencing. So I always love to pick the brains of people who are actually out in the field doing this day after day, right? And I have so many questions because I've, I've talked to hundreds of people now from doing the show. And one of the things that you mentioned a couple of times that I, I want to get into and sort of pick your brain about that I have always been very curious about is tree structures. You know, I've had Shane Corson on the show from the Olympic Project. We've talked about the nest site that that they're working and continuing to work. And, you know, that's a little different than a tree structure. And Absolutely. I have found things here on my property in North Carolina. Recently, I was filming a television show and they, they had to come out and do some pickups recently. And we're hiking through the woods here. And I come up on this area that I'd walked past before. And there's all these trees like interwoven together. And it was, you know, the, the cameraman was like, hey, what's that over there? And I'm like, well, let me go check it out. And I'm like, holy shit, this looks like a tree structure on my property, 250, 300 yards from my house. And the more I looked at it, and I'm sure when people, when the, when the show comes out next year, you're going to look at it and say, well, that looks like it's been, you know, somebody had to make that or somebody had to just plant that for you to find. Well, no, it's, it's literally that close to my house. And we've hiked past there with the dogs before. And I've, I've saw the trees down, but I, I promise I'm getting to a question. I'm, I'm starting to ramble. <laughs> I, my, my, my point to you is I have, you know, I, I'm a one-to-one -one correlation kind of guy. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm former law enforcement. I spent 16 years as a cop and I want to know where the evidence comes from. And yeah. to my knowledge, and I, I could be wrong, I don't, I've never personally taken an, a, an encounter or I've never personally taken a sighting that said, Hey, I walked up on a Sasquatch making a tree structure. All right. So I guess my point is, is a, what do you think the purpose is? Why do they do it? And what is the, you know, I've, I've heard other people have theories that, you know, it's a, it's more of a marker than, you know, clearly what's on my property. They're not, there's nothing staying in there. It's not enough of a structure to provide any type of shelter. So I guess I'll shut up and ask the question. What, what do you think the tree structures are and what are you finding and what is your theory behind the tree structures? Well, this could be it an entire episode on its own because this is what I I've spent a large part of my life trying to document and I'm exactly like you if if you go to my website House of Enoch on Facebook you'll never hear me say a Bigfoot did this unless I physically see a Bigfoot doing this I always say the individual e even the pictures and stuff that I post I one thing my research partner taught me was that that if, if you didn't see it with your own two eyes, then don't jump to that, keep, keep it science-based, uh, fact-based. But um, we've been looking at tree structures for almost a decade now. Um, one of the things that really, really opened my mind was when I told you I, I'd seen these, uh, eight, found 18 tree structures that the day after that they were built. Um, and I also had the opportunity for a year to watch these structures every single day. Um, and one of the things I learned was nothing ever came back to these structures. There was one, and there was one that actually had some activity in it throughout the course of the year. The other ones that were built pretty much 
watched them fall to the ground. I mean, it was almost like a temporary purpose, but that got me going. So where I was at there directly, my hike that I did every day was 65 acre of land, which tied into another 250 acres. And then across the street, another 250 acres. Um, and so that was kind of my area. I ended up um, hiking about every inch of all that and finding every structure that you know you could find out there. Documented that. And then I would just document any new structure, anything. And this current property that I was at at the time it, those 18 structures only happened two nights out of the entire year. There was never another structure built of an actual structure. So let's say TP types and stuff like this. One thing I did notice was a lot of smaller stuff would happen all the time. And it's, I mean, now doing what I, I do now, I know that most of the stuff that's going on is happening right under our noses. And the thing is, we are not out in the woods enough to notice it. Just, it's impossible. I was able, I've got over 10,000 pictures I've documented. I've got what people call leaners, you know, documented moving throughout the woods on different trees. And maybe there's two sticks. Next week, there's one stick. And now they've changed trees. Little things like that, that you would just, you know, the weekend warrior is never, ever, ever going to be able to pick up on this, including myself. It's when I hike out here, it, it, it I have enough property here. It, it takes me uh, a little over a week to do the whole thing. So I always feel like when I do find something new, it's either it's within that time period. Um, and it's not as, it's not as, common as a lot of people think i think there's some structures that are out there that are more like landmarks something like that and then there's other ones of day-to-day -day information so that is passing on and, and kind of the way i i feel these things move i i my theory is they have Scouts, basically, wherever the family group's going, they send out scouts. The scouts' entire job is to make sure there's no there's no danger. Nothing's changed, nothing. And the scouts will go out ahead of the family group, and they will provide the information, that little stuff that I would see. All of it has meaning. Maybe it's, hey, saw someone over here, so we're going this way. It's navigating them through the forest, which is also why I believe that they're so hard to spot on trail cams because I believe that's the job of the scouts. Anything that is, is different in the woods, it's their job to steer around it. And we've done enough research over the years that with trail cams getting marked, go out in a, a good area, um, and we would basically hang our trail cam visibly, and then we do a 360 around the entire trail cam and just let it sit out there for a month or two. And if it was in a good area, there would be a structure or something that would just, that you'd see it like, hey, there's a big X now. Something would mark that trail cam to let it know whatever that it, you know, they basically found it. And I believe this because on my old property someone tried to get in after i i filmed the rock throw video someone came in may have been government i don't know all the trail cams were the same issue but they put in five trail cameras in my area and i found four of them in one day and then within three days i knew where every single trail cam was and i was never on that trail cam once so if you have an eye for something like that and if you think about this if someone puts moves around your lawn chair in your backyard, you're going to notice it because it's your backyard. 
these things, it's the same thing. Um, they, they talk, communicate basically under our noses. And we, we see the big structures and we see this stuff that all has information. Um, I have a pretty recent acquaintance, um, which is another story that so was really interesting for this next year. But um, this gentleman, I he's doesn't live too far from me. He's uh, he's into the same thing, and and I love that the term he uses. He calls it wood talk, and to me, that is a perfect description of what is going on out there. And I think people are always trying to say, well, this points to water, or I, I think you gotta get your human brain out of it. Um, I moved in and within three months, I knew where every natural spring was. I knew where every creek in my area. I, don't, I didn't need to market. You know, you live in the area, you live in the environment, you don't need signs for that. Um, so I think it's more if you if you don't have paper and a pen and you want to leave your buddy a note and all you have is sticks, I think it's more closer to that. I think it's either a word, it's definitely some communication. And this this has guided me um, right now at, at where I live now. I know it's over 110, but I've documented in three different counties. And some of this gives you the ability to kind of, so, so, some of these signs make it easier for you to follow them. Some of them are their own thing. Some of this information I've got, I believe um, I've had help on. And I know back to you, like when people hear about, structures and stuff some some people are like man that's it's almost laughable until it's at your house until it's on your property and you, i mean behind me right now where i'm sitting is six miles of woods before there is ever a road my neighbors are 80 years old i love to shoot guns and tannerite and everything but nobody comes back on my property on my road, if you head down my gravel road north, there's only three houses in 10 miles. We're remote. And the stuff that I, you know, when I moved in here, I documented everything on my property and everything since. So I know, <laughs> I, I know that that's, there's no, this is all private land. You know, there's thousands of acres of private land. I know who my neighbors are. I know that's not my neighbors. I have a footprint. I know I know the the radio listeners can't, but that is not my footprint. If you can see it, you know, for, for the web viewers, that that was filmed in my pond. I casted um, after hearing it all night in my pond. But these it, I guess the best way I can describe it is it's communication. And one of the things I did was uh, I found one of these structures uh, crossed across the street from me and did click away. And at the time I just thought I'm gonna do an experiment, which I do, I do a lot now. Um, but at the time, I, I found this and wasn't sure there was a there was a dead turkey and then about 20 yards away there was a, a little teepee like structure so I just made my own little structure and I put it there beside it like acknowledging it went back to the house didn't think anything about it I it was a couple weeks later I go out to, to go on my hike I walk out in my backyard, and in my backyard is the same exact sign that I left half a mile away next to that structure. And what it what basically all it was was three three sticks and a triangle with a rock in the middle. I go in my backyard, walk right up, right on the trail that I always use to go out to the woods, 
there's three sticks and a triangle with a rock in the middle of it. And I'm like, and that really started off a, uh, some communication. Um, up, up on the ridge ahead of me, there was, I went for several months where I was having communication back and forth uh, with something. And what was crazy about, it, I don't trust anybody. You know, I, I don't. I have seven surveillance cameras covering my driveway. That's the only way in from the road. So whatever was coming in and doing this was from coming six miles behind me. That's the, because everything else is covered. Um, and I would check that. I would think, you know, was my buddies messing with me? Or something? And it was just, it was just not. And it ended up having uh whatever this was it, it was it had a nine inch print that year so i ended up tracking this nine inch print through the woods not not so much prints but if you know how to track you know i i went and i was miles back behind me found a little another little tree stump kind of similar to what was near my place right along the trail where this thing's been walking and I started doing it again, leaving little signs and started having activity there. And I didn't tell anybody that I was doing this, no one. So that to me was proof that at least whatever I was dealing with was coming from deep in the woods. But one thing it did do, it, uh, I believe it was trying to communicate in a way that to try to teach because I learned some stuff from it. Um, and it took me getting lost. Every once in a while, I'll get back here and it'll get dark and I, it'll, I'll get turned around. And uh, I got lost and I, I got to a point where I could hear my pond. But I came in, you know, I could hear the frogs and stuff in my pond. So I knew I was close, but I came in just a completely different angle from where this stump was. And it was just, it dawned on me. I'm like, holy, holy crap. That's what it's been trying to say all along, basically. So I looked at that information and I followed it from what I perceived. Went across, went up the other ridge and there's a 20 foot star structure, <laughs> right? Right where, right where this information was basically telling me to, to look. And then from that one, using that kind of information, I found another one. And so some of this I think is navigational and some of it is day-to-day -day, day -day information. Um, but I don't think it's, I don't necessarily think it's, you know, the, the stuff that I've seen here, I, I, I don't think it's for me, except maybe that stump might've been. Um, since I've moved in, there's been six X's on both sides of my property, just almost saying, and one of them's right by my, right on the other side of my pond, which I've had a lot of activity when I moved in. There was a lot of activity over on the other side of the pond that I would hear. And I'd sit out on my deck at night and I'd just listen. And one of those X's was right up beside the waterway. I mean, you can't miss it. And it wasn't there the day before. And there was even a, I think off my deck, uh, one of those planter buckets, uh, like you put plants in a red one. I had been fishing down there and I noticed about, you know, 10 feet in the water, there was a, a red planter bucket that must have blown off the deck, made its way in the pond. And I just made a mental note to myself that I, that I need to go out there and get that. I'm, I hate litter. Um, but not only was that X right there by my pond, that red planter bucket was out of the pond and on a stump, like per perched up. And it's, I guess the only thing I can tell people is when, when you, when it happens to you and you live in an area where you can really rule out, um, the human factor and hikers and because I you know even when I go to 
national forests and stuff now i try to get as far off trail as you can just to try to eliminate a lot of that um but what's happened on your property and you see it and like i said the the, the track i showed you the the stuff that goes on i mean i've i've sat here on my deck with rocks hitting the tin roof um no, you know, it's pitch dark out there. Something actually where I casted that, that was something uh was one of the few times where I, I was out here and it felt like wasn't really scared. Um, I just sat there and there was these little little rocks, but they kept hit. I collected the rocks, there were five of them, hit, hit, hitting the tin roof of my of my outdoor i have a, a covered deck as well i have a big deck and then part of it's covered so i'm sitting out there in the dark that's going on and then i hear it sounds like someone's swimming in my pond i mean just swishing you know and i didn't try to get up i didn't try to film it i just i just out there had probably having a drink and enjoying you know it just it felt it felt cool the next day I went down, there was a sapling in my pond that didn't belong there. That had been pulled from the forest. And there was these footprints, not only the one I, I showed on the camera, but there was a small one beside it. So that I figured out what they were doing. That's also where all the tadpoles and stuff spawn. There's all these, these uh, bowls like in the pond uh, where they'll dig out and they'll lay their eggs. And they're real string, like you can grab them and it'll kind of sticky. They were taking that tree, that using that sapling, and they were standing at the edge of the pond and they were they were probably stirring that and getting all those eggs, all that stringy stuff on the branches and pulling them off and, and eating them. And this is this is uh, 40 yards from where I'm sitting. This is going on. Um it's stuff like that. I mean, the one thing I've learned with living out in the woods like this is you, you really know nature. And you also get a feel for what's normal, what's what's uh, the normal vibe. And in the winter, it sounds like Jurassic Park out here. You know, it's just things are it's loud and then in the winter you could hear a pin drop i mean it's as quiet as quiet can be but you can tell from the insects all the prey have a a communication system when when it could be a fox it could be me any kind of predator gets in that area you can if you attune your ear to it you can you know exactly where whatever's coming in because it gets quiet and then it, as it's moving that part of the woods gets quiet and that that's just normal you know trees falling branches falling all that stuff is like normal owls there there's the normal sounds of the woods that it it's when you live out here you get used to that but then when it gets weird it gets weird and it, it's totally totally something different um my last but my to put it in perspective my last uh encounter here was september 14th i have september 14th through september 21st was the last time some stuff happened that i was able to record um a couple tree knocks that i did get on video um i was sitting out back one of these nights and um it sounded like a, a very if you could if you if you could think of a cow if a cow could talk that mumble this thing was something was out in the woods and it was mumbling and it went from that and i kept trying to get it on my recorder and then it stopped and then uh, I'd wait a little while and 
out here I'm always worried about battery life and, and that. And then this thing pops off from doing that to almost like it was singing. Then it was just, it actually was very pretty sounded. But it's so far off in left field that it's like, there's nothing out here that sounds like that. I mean, this thing was like serenading. Um, and it was pretty. I mean, it was a, it actually, I'm a musician. Uh, it was one of the things I do too. And I'm like, that thing's carrying a pretty good. No, that wasn't like, it's, it wasn't words, but it was like a humming type and it went higher pitch and down. And it was just bizarre. It, it, some of that stuff you don't even want to tell anybody about because they're not going to believe you anyway. Like I tell a lot of people, you're just going to have to experience it yourself. And people have had experiences here. Um, I almost, I got a new, a new FLIR. I got the uh, Pulsar. Helion 2 Pro, and that was right around this time. And I was actually up in the woods trying to just look for tracks and stuff where this stuff was coming from the next day. And as I'm coming out of the woods, um, and I am following, I'm following something, you know, it's not prints, but it's, it's movement that I can see. I come out of the woods and I get over to the other woods uh, the next patch of woods basically there's a separation right when right from the area i just left just a gigantic tree knock um which i got on video that's probably the last tree knock on house v knock but i just dropped i dropped right there where i was at because i had my my really good flare and i tried to wait this thing out i'm laying there and it uh I know that has to, if it's going to, it's, uh, I come to the conclusion that this thing's tracking me. I'm trying to track these bees and something's tracking me now. And so I just lay there and it gets dark and I'm like, I've got the perfect angle for this thing. All I got to do is wait and it's going to come out and I'm going to get it. I'm going to get it on camera on the, on the FLIR. And as time goes on, I hear something behind me and it's, it's come. So now I've got something up there that hasn't moved, but now I got something creeping up behind me and I can hear it breathing. It's real heavy, <sighs> like real heavy breaths. I don't know whether it's a bear or what it is, but I'm, I'm in a position where I, I can't get flanked. I'm out here, like I told you, the emergency services, I'm, I'm dead in the water. So I had to get up. My legs were asleep. Um, I get up and I kind of stumble over and I try to get positioned. I get the cabin positioned uh, behind me. So at least whatever's going to come to me has to come from only one, one angle. And that basically gave up my location and, and just all the activity stopped after that. But that's my my hope is to be basically a fly on the wall out here to um be here at the right time i got i've got a flare that 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 will get a heat signature um i've gotten a great heat signature from before that was very well documented it was over nine feet tall uh that's on there as well if people want to look at that and a whole a whole 45 minute video of explaining exactly how I determined the size of this thing because I, I could go right back to the trees. I could put a white dot on the tree, my height, superimpose everything, and this thing was giant. So my hope is that we're going to have that here. You know, at some point or another, it's the activity is sporadic. Um, it's, it is, uh, but it's, I believe we have been able to track now through three counties. I believe nothing's living in these woods, but what they're using is just a travel. It's a travel way. Um, but I've got about 110 sites of a radius, about a 20 mile radius, where we've documented the movements of whatever's here, uh, which I believe there's at least four that move through here. 
And what's crazy is, uh, you know, we've been doing this for a couple it, it, cause it takes to, to, to do three counties. It's taken three years to get three counties worth of data logged in. But during that time, there was a, uh, it's called the Stoutsville Bigfoot sighting. And it was uh, on the BFR page. And they had Matt Moneymaker came down. They had, they had everybody um, investigating this thing. And all they could really did it, they did a good investigation, but that there's really nothing that they could do with it. Except we're sitting on the exact same trail that we've been documenting for three years was in a straight line, exact straight line where the sighting was. So we feel like like that was what we've been tracking for three all this data that we have from footprints to the audio and some of the signs and stuff that they're leaving behind is this exact same individual that someone had a, a pretty good sighting on um and it did when you take a google earth map basically is what i do i pin everything i find and i have the all the information there and what it ended up doing it made a circle a radius and if you look at the radius where it deviates and goes deeper into the woods you can blow blow up google earth there's a house there's a farmhouse or something there so it's just staying consistently away from the houses and it goes through a tremendous area of private land to uh another national forest into that national forest through private land back into a national forest um is basically what we've done tracking and and what we did during covid was everything shut down so we took that opportunity to uh, and i got laid off um, my buddy was laid off we we went and took that opportunity and set out here and, and went all the way over into the national forest so, so basically seven days of just tracking wherever i mean we were up on a ridge behind farmers houses at night i mean we we're just obviously probably doing a little bit of trespassing but we just i mean we're just hammocks you know in the woods at night just fall like someone's got to do it at some time someone's got to follow follow these tracks and see where they're going what they're doing so we did and it ended up in a national forest um the last night there we ended up i mean this whole time i we felt like we were just we're never going to catch these things, but at least we could document that. But we, the last night, we ended up hearing a couple vocals in, in the national forest uh, that we were able to record, and they were far off. So we we're we we're still probably a day's hike behind this thing, but it was just beyond that is where they where the Stoutsville sighting was. So interesting, you know, when when you put put the data together, what what you can get. And that's one of the things that I appreciate the most about folks like you in the field that that actually get out and do the work and do the documentation. I don't think people realize what it takes to be that dedicated. So I say thank you because shows like this benefit greatly because tens and thousands of people are going to be able to listen to this and sort of gain the same knowledge that you've put the last you know decade of work into. They can get it in an hour plus and a yeah. podcast. And I think that's one of the, the special things. And one of the things I, I keep coming back to and doing the show week after week, because I think that information is so powerful because people are going out and they are finding things and they don't know what it is. You know, yeah. they, they haven't, there are these weekend warriors, as you said, even me, you know, walking around, I've got 40 acres here and I see things that I'm like, mm, that's a little strange. And I've walked past it 10 times before I ever just walk over and take a really close look at it. And there's no telling what I've missed sure. on this property, you know? So I really think it's important for, for folks like you to do shows like this, to, to impart that knowledge. And I'd certainly love to have you back, man. It sounds like we just scratched the surface on <laughs> so many things we could talk about. I was scratching notes as you were talking and I've got like 10 things I should have asked you during the, the interview. So we'll definitely have to, 
work out the schedules and get you back on, man. It's been an honor and a pleasure to have you on the show. I've really enjoyed it. Absolutely. It's a, uh, like I said, it's, it's just, um, what I tell people is you got to be in it. Like for me, I have a giant love of outdoors. I have an outdoor site, outdoor living, primitive living. Um, you've got, it's got to be more than just looking for Bigfoot. If you're going to be in it for the long haul. Um, cause it's, I mean, from a guy that's, we've hiked over 3000 miles and on our, on our hikes and, you know, going 46 weekends a year, all the stuff we used to do to maybe out of that three or four times that year to have something special happen. So it's gotta be more, or you're going to get burned out. Um, when I go out and I hike every day, whether something happens or not, I'm a lover of nature. I'm, I'm learning plant edibles. I'm, I'm a rock hound. I love looking for fossils. Uh, I love being out in nature. So it's never a bad day to be in the woods. And as long as you have that kind of mentality, um, then when something special happens, it happens. And I think that's what gives you the longevity. Cause I, I know there's been times we would go a year we go a year and be like, man, nothing happened. I mean, we're, what are we doing wrong? Um, and, and, but if you, if you have other loves besides that, you, it, you can, it'll carry you through for the long haul. And I, I really think it's, if a Sasquatch was ran over by a car tomorrow and everybody said, Hey, you know, Sasquatch is real we would still be 10, 20 years away from having any kind of answers about what they are, who they are, um, because it's, it's going to take, I think this, the scientific community, it's going to take them 10, 20, they're going to have to do what we've been doing and uh, maybe better funded, but I believe they're going to have to rely on our community to get them started um, that I've been doing it for years, but you know, I don't, I'm not, I don't care about the sightings anymore. I, I want to know how they live. That's, and when I come across a track, you know, I don't just take a picture of that track. That's like, to me, I'm standing in front of something that shouldn't exist. This is, this is a legend of something. And I want to know why it's here. Why did, why did, why is it in this woods? I want to know what it's looking for. I want to know everything about this thing's life more than I care to even see it and that's why I try to do the the fly on the wall approach I don't care if I see them out here but if I'm there the day after and I can look around and see what they're eating and what trace evidence they leave behind I'm happy because I'm actually learning something about the creature itself and I think the more people when you start looking into the wood talk and stuff what you're going to see is a social structure you're, you're going to see more than an ape you're going to see, you're going to see a social structure that, um, I mean, we, I, I get a lot, I don't want to get off track, but I've had conversations with Shane Corson about the, you know, the nest sites. We can take what we have found in Ohio. I've done it with him. The correlations of the formations and how the area that they're in, you, you know, we have found a nest site in Ohio and taking the information that we've had would blow people away just how much it connects to something on the other side of the country. Um, without ever talking to him before, we could lay down a nice basis of, like I could kind of tell him how the nests were, the formations of them, about the elevations they were in. Um, I tell him a lot of the stuff without ever talking to him just by what we've learned here. So there's a huge correlation when groups that are actually out doing the work talk to each other i mean it, it it opens up another door every single time yeah i couldn't agree more man and that's that's one of the things shane and i talked about when i had him on the show is they're out doing this work in the pacific northwest but yet things are being found in other places like ohio and just the correlations between the two and 
if you don't talk and you don't communicate, you don't share that kind of information, nobody knows. And then it's like, oh, holy shit. Well, you found the same thing I found in British Columbia and in Georgia and in Florida and Tennessee and Ohio. And I think it's just, I've had people on the show. I do a paranormal show as well. And I think it was Preston Dennett that I had on. He just kept telling me, Brian, everything's connected. And the more I do these shows and the more people I talk to, I I firmly believe that everything truly is at the end of the day connected. Yeah. Tell us one more time. I know you've got the house of Enoch. Is it a website? You got a YouTube, you got Facebook, tell everybody where they can find it. And I'll certainly link to it in the show notes for the show as well. Uh, Easiest way I have a house of Enoch on Facebook is uh, it's just my, it's like a journal. I mean, if someone wants to learn something, go back to the first video and you can, you can take the journey with me as I go. Um, I have uh, another outdoor site that's called off the trail. It's just all about outdoor living. It's basically everything on the days where I'm not getting any research information. It's my other video on, you know, whatever, making tinctures of medicinals or uh, restoring furniture, anything to do with out, outdoor life. And then from there, you can, I have a YouTube page, but it's not, it, I haven't, uh, I'm still looking for a good platform to really put everything on. So right now, the best one's House of Enoch on Facebook. Awesome. Like I said, I'll definitely link to it and everybody go check it out. Kane, thanks so much for coming on the show, man. I really enjoyed it. Absolutely. All right. That was awesome, man. <laughs> I, I knew it would be. Um I, like I said, I, I would love to, we didn't even touch on the woo and the paranormal and oh, all yeah. those things I wanted to, to sort of pick your brain and, and get. So if we can certainly line up schedules, I'd love to, to get you back on and, and maybe yeah. even talk about some of those things. Have you had paranormal stuff yeah. happen? Oh, Absolutely. Okay. The lights I've doc, uh, I've documented the lights out in the woods three times on video. I actually have it on video. Um, I've had it out here. I had it at my old place. Um, definitely like you were saying there's there's so much more and i wanted to get into it a little bit but it's uh this guy that i a recent acquaintance of mine um lives out here he's been researching this area for 50 years wow. and he uh he's he's a modern day spook all right so he was uh, in the military. He was uh, he, he was in uh, special forces. Highly decorated guy. When he got out, um, he was they put a bounty on his head, an- another country, and they told him that he'd have to lay low the rest of his life. Um, which he took. I mean, this thirty years later, and this guy lives out in the woods gate it like you have to have a key card to talk to him doesn't use the internet doesn't have the only doesn't text you have to just call him leave a message and he'll call you kind of doesn't go by his real name you know um but this guy this guy has evidence better than todd standing but i mean pictures he doesn't even know who todd standing is and i just have to be really careful um given too much information out there because i'm worried i'm worried like be really you know this guy i know he's i mean he he's definitely been wounded i mean he's he gets around the woods all right but he's, he's covered in shrapnel i've seen all of his medals all the stuff that he does but he he goes out in the woods snipe and like sniper three days at a time clears his bowels out pees out the side <laughs> and, and sits there and some of the pictures he has, I mean, will blow your, blow your mind. And he's the one we, they, someone put me in contact with him because he had, he talks about this wood talk, which I've always called it structures. But I mean, he's got 50 years of this stuff and it's amazing. Like I, I take my information to, and his, like it, what I believe it means. And he's got stuff and he ended up I started doing some research with him and he wanted to go in this area I I got I'll show you a little bit of it but there was a new thing out in the woods 
uh, he was <laughs> um <Holy> shit <laughs> yeah this is a three three toed those are claws wow. um that he needed to get in these woods and he needed someone to protect him to to get in here to get these casts um or look for casts and actually me and my research partner are the ones who found the prints you know we went down there and just i mean there's a story leading up to like this guy didn't trust me i didn't trust him we go through this dance for well over a month before i even meet him i don't know this guy for any man i don't trust anybody you know right. i don't and he ends up telling me you know he share he starts sharing me some pictures and i'm like well these are either fake or this is some of the best evidence i've ever seen in my life I Google searched them. I, I say invites me to go to this place, and he tells me he's like, "I'm." Uh, he stops me. He's like, "Let's be clear." He's like, "We've never been out in the woods together," and he's like, um, "If you freak out, if you see one of these creatures and you freak out and you put my life in danger, I'll blow your fucking head off where you stand." And he just <laughs> stared at me, <laughs> and I'm like. Uh all right i'm like well i said i i think you'll find out that i'm i'm hard to scare so we end up i mean it was tense but we end up found like exactly what he was looking for we have another track that actually has a palm to it too but it broke so you have these claws and it has like a a heel we just couldn't get it out so we're, that's currently what we're working on and me and this guy we, we've actually pretty good friends now and he's got well i was telling you like my data is three counties mm -hmm. so it's kind of from me <clears throat> north all the way west he's got 50 years of maps that he gave me of all wow. his stuff so now we've got like this gigantic area um with what this guy is and then like I said, we, we went in where he said, and we found these crazy prints. So I, I'm excited about this this year coming up, uh, getting out with this guy and uh, getting like he's almost close enough. Like he'll call me, and um, the way the roads are out here, it's just I he's the next major road. So if he hears something hollering out in the woods, he'll call because it's there's a likelihood we might be able to both hear it. Um, but he's been interesting so far. He's some of the stuff he's got dog man stuff. He's got, <laughs> I mean, mind blowing stuff. Um, and then he's got some great Sasquatch stuff and from his, you know, he has surveillance and stuff uh, like his, he lives kind of like in a cow, I would say it's more of like a double wide, but where he lives, he's got surveillance camera. And he, I mean, you can see shadows. There's things like the size of a, a outdoor garage height goes by and it's got a tail. <laughs> he's got crazy. Wow. And, and he's done, I mean, like I said, he don't even know what to do with this information. He's not on the internet. He's, he is well i was about to say i'd love to have him on the show but it doesn't sound like he's one of the the guys that's going to come on a podcast and talk about the things that he's he's experienced yeah i think he's he's uh he's got ptsd really bad too hmm. so he's i mean I, i've got the personality um to kind of deal with someone like that but he's i mean he's the shit he's got and this what he showed me so far it, it's crazy you know and just the knowledge that he had you know i've been in this area for three years and he's been in there 50 wow. you know his whole whole life and he's probably in his 60s I, i'd have to i don't even know his real name i just know i know what he goes by and he told he told me that but you know he does all this and that's how he lives man you go into town with him dude drives 90 through these he, he thinks people are <laughs> are still might be out to get them and i don't know if they are or, or what but um i know he's got the scars to prove he's got the medals to prove it um and he definitely lives this life where that's what he does he's he goes out in the woods and he sets up and takes 
pictures that I'll probably never see the light of day. <laughs> yeah, I think there's a lot of that, man. I, it's funny you mentioned Todd Standing. He's actually going to come on the show. I just we're we've been working to to get our schedules together over the last couple of weeks, and I think yeah, it may be after the first of the year before I'm able to to sit down and interview him. But I've been trying to get him on the show forever, and I've kind of called him out in the past. Some yeah. of the things, you know, I'm like, eh, I'm not so sure that that's actually what you say it is. And when I had Les Stroud on the show, we talked a lot about Todd and their friends. And he, after Les told me kind of off there, he's like, after Todd hears this show with me, he's probably going to want to come on your show. And I was like, oh, well, imagine that. He, he emailed right. like a week ago and I'm, <laughs> I'm actually going to get him on the show after all that. So, yeah, I've had, yeah, I've had uh, several conversations via email with Todd. Um, my thoughts on Todd are, I don't know about the pitchers, but I think the guy, the guy's knowledge is spot on with what I've learned and what I, I believe the guy knows what he's talking about for sure. Whether the pitchers are, I tell people like, imagine you're just watching a monster quest show and it's an animated Bigfoot, but the information's good. And it might be real big, but I don't know. But the information he has is, I mean, a there's a shred of truth. You know, you get in the, in the, the community and everybody's across the board, but then there's the, the truth that, that you learn by being in the woods, experiencing it for yourself. And you hear, I've even heard on your shows, um, someone will be talking and I'll be like, that dude's, that dude's for real. He's, he's, yep. cause it's like, I, I know exactly what he's talking about and some of the stuff they're describing. It's like people that have experienced know, and it's kind of your bullshit meter, you know, um, what the truth is. And that's like why I can talk to Shane Corson cross. And there's a thread of truth of facts that are the same there as they are here. It's the same thing. And uh, the whole, I mean, I could go into so much more. I try to, I try to not give out too much public information on some things. I keep close to my chest because we have a way of uh, knowing like with certain structures, whether they're real or not. And mm -hmm. it's just, I've never heard it talked about, but this is one of the things I felt was shown to me. That is one, and that's why I didn't really get into it. But when I came across the ridge, it was, I seen it from a different perspective, but I seen other things. So it's almost like the main thing was not even what I should be looking at. And once I started doing that, um, it can't be hoaxed because no one's ever, I've never heard anybody talk about it. Um, and it has allowed us, it works, go from site to site, to site, to site. And part of that, when we went on that, journey through these that's what we were doing we were taking that theory because it did it led me straight to two other ones and just expanded that and then in the meantime i mean we we're finding tracks we we're finding it's like this is this is working you know and we've taken it out of state it it is the same thing there's there's when i say that it's like uh wood you know wood talk some of I don't know all of them. I don't even have a clue half, half of it, but I do know some of them. It's definitely directional. You know, I mean, it there. If you imagine, if you can imagine, just I think I've seen some like okay, you have a ridge, you know, the ridge above, and then there's a, we're going this way. It's the picture of the ridge built in sticks, you know, with the. It's some of it's like people always try to put these human terms to this stuff and it's not, it's a lot of it is just like a, if you could um, use for a word or a description and you're using sticks instead. And I know one of the words for uh, Sasquatch is um, Seco. That means stick Indians. Mm -hmm. You know, back then they would walk into a territory, they would see this stuff. They know I better get out of here. <laughs> they were wrecking, they were calling them sticky Indians because of the stick structure, as my belief. And we just forgot. 
yeah. we have forgotten. I think most Native American tribes have probably forgot what that stuff means because we we got out of the woods. But they're still using the same communication as they always have. Yeah, it's, it's crazy, it's, man. Yeah. Well, I definitely want to stay in touch. I I'm trying to put together. Uh, at some point in time after the first of the year, maybe the first couple of months of the year, I'd like to do like a round table and have, you know, four or five people. I think I've got um, Deborah Hatswell from the UK. I talked to her this morning and I may have her on. I may, I'd like to maybe try to get Jeff Meldrum back and maybe even Les Stroud. I talked to Les about it when I had him on and yeah, I'd love to have a group discussion and talk yeah. about some of these things together and kind of get everybody's mind. It's almost like a mini, my, my, I envision it as almost like a mini Bigfoot conference, you know, in a podcast. Right. You know? And uh, if you're interested in that, I'd love to stay in touch with you. And, and Oh yeah, man. Definitely. When I, uh, when I get it put together, okay. yeah, I'd love to have you back for sure. Yeah. I'm out here. There's not much going on. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, awesome. I'll definitely stay in touch. I'll, um, uh, Matter of fact, I'll either have Danny or I'll email you at some point and just shoot you my, my cell phone to, you know, if anything comes up or you, you find anything crazy or whatever, I'll just give you my personal cell and you can yeah. shoot me a text or give me a call or whatever. Uh, you probably ain't. can't get the lighting good enough. There's the other one. Oh, yeah. See, the, see the, the rest of the palm, the palm was gone. But yeah, I, that's kind of stuff we're getting right now. It's something I don't, it's not Sasquatch, but it's something. Uh, well, so I'm yeah, definitely I'll keep you into, yeah, I'm definitely into all the cryptids, man. So let's yeah. definitely stay in touch and I'd love to have you back for sure. Sounds good, buddy. Awesome, man. Well, I got another interview at eight, so I'm going to go get ready and uh, I'll holler at you later. Okay. Take care, buddy. It's nice meeting you. Awesome. You too, bud.